if I was a fly on the wall on the 12th of March in 2020 in the BitNex HQ, like, what was happening? The exchange doesn't work anymore. And everything goes to zero. What's going on through your mind? We didn't really do anything. We said, these are the rules and that's just part of the game. <laughs> yeah. Classic. Our guest today is Arthur Hayes. He's the co-founder and ex-CEO of BitMEX, now the CIO at Maelstrom Fund and a popular macroeconomics writer. Where do you think BitMEX would be today if there was no COVID? The end game is some sort of societal reset, I think. Hopefully not as bad as the Great Depression or you know World War One or World War II, but I think we're headed in a similar sort of direction where you're going to have to choose one or the other. Go buy a house and uh, become a farmer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're bootstrapping basically BitMEX? Yes. I know how to do this. I did this for my whole professional career. I could do it better. It took us 11 months to build the product. We launched in November 2014. And then for the next basically year, we basically did no volume, essentially, mm. like zero. How did the BitMEX ID come along? The issue with uh, IC Bet the exchange was me and a lot of the other traders, we really wanted them to improve the product offering, offer more stuff, it can increase liquidity because we were all making money. We just want to make more money. So we needed them to grow as an exchange so we had more people to trade against. Yeah, it was very disheartening. It's hard. In the back of my mind, I was 100% confident that Bitcoin derivatives or crypto derivatives would be massive. There would be a few companies making a lot of money. The only question is, can I survive long enough to get there? What was the golden moment of BitMEX to bear market? or more like the bull market 2017. How are you doing, man? Excellent. It's good, good to have this conference in where I live, so it's nice. Are you in Korea last week? Yes, I was in right? Korea. How was it? Excellent. The, the energy in Korea is amazing. So many retail punters of crypto. I love it. Have you been often there? The last time I was there was in 2019, I think. But I've been many a few times before. So I love Seoul. It's a great place. I, so I, I'm a fan of your articles. Mm -hmm. I love them. One of them, you talk about the fact that you love coffee. Yes. I love coffee too. Like, what can you tell me about coffee? You love for coffee. Uh, so I, I wrote about this cafe that I went to in Paris yeah. like a few months ago, and it was amazing. So it's this one guy, you had to make a reservation, you show up, it's about six or, six or eight other people in the in the bar. Mm -hmm. And he's got a board on on there, and he's just talking about the different coffees he has. He has a special coffee of the day. And I'm not a big espresso drinker. I find that it's usually very burnt. Mm. And he's like, okay, because you got to try my espresso. It's like my signature thing. He had a special way of, um, I don't know, not even grinding the beans. It's how he filtered them. He had a metal filter and the temperature and the roast that he used for the beans. And I have to say, it's the best espresso I've ever had in my life. Okay. And okay. then all of the single origins, you know, he did the pour over as well, but he also would do them in espresso format as well. It was really nice to have like some super high quality, like I love geisha varietal mm. beans, like floral, light roast, and to taste that in the espresso format. Um, this guy was excellent. He even made his own water. You know, he talked wow. us through like okay. the different okay. like uh, minerals that he would put in the water that he distilled so that it brought up the certain taste that he wanted in his coffee. So I thought it was an excellent experience. Do you have the same passion for wine? Uh, I love drinking wine. Do I know enough about it? Probably not. Much less. Okay. Yeah, much less. Um, obviously, because you actually get drunk, so it's not like yeah. you just can <laughs> cane wine all day. <laughs> but Fair I do enough. like like lower intervention wine. Uh, it's okay. like one of my things. Actually, Singapore is a great scene for that. Yeah. In terms of like different, lots of different wine bars and restaurants that only serve like low intervention, low sulfite wine, which I like. I see on Twitter, you're also a foodie. You like to post pictures yeah. of food. Yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting, you know, because I mean, for this podcast, today is a bit of a different format. It's, it's a, a shorter, but for this podcast, we, to go viral, we use AI and data analytics to kind of script questions and everything right. to be, to be more likely to go viral on these short clips because right. today consumption is so, all through short clips. Right. Yeah. And I really had a big love because I usually send the guest and I say, okay, this is Arthur. Here are these socials. Yeah. What can you write that would be interesting to talk about that could go viral? Right. And I, and I was laughing because I knew they would struggle with you. And they basically came back and they said, sorry, but we can't do anything with this dude. <laughs> <laughs> so the online strategy of, uh, of uh, sheet posting yeah. is working really well. Uh, but I know a lot about, I mean, crypto and your story. So like for me, the interesting is why you studied in the US, right? Yes. Why did you move to Hong Kong initially? Why did you choose Hong Kong and Asia? Uh, so in, in like my last year of high school, I was reading a book called The Ugly Americans. I forgot the name of the author. And it's about this American guy, graduate from university, didn't know what he wanted to do, somehow decided he was going to move out to Tokyo. And so he started mm -hmm. trading um, the Nikkei 
back in either the late 90s or early 2000s. It's a true story. Mm -hmm. And it takes you through his life and like partying and having a lot of fun. And then eventually he makes, he hits it really big on this one particular trade. I think it was a Nikkei rebalance in some particular year. He made a lot of money and then he started a hedge fund. Uh, and the hedge fund, the real name of the hedge fund is called Evolution. And I know a lot of people who work there and um, I never actually met the guy in person, but I was like, wow, I really, this sounds like a lot of fun. I'm like sitting in my suburban, you know, house in Buffalo, New York, boring ass small town and like New York state. And like, I want to get out of here and go somewhere interesting. And like, this sounds so cool. But at the time I thought, well, Japan, that was sort of a, you know, early 80s story. Like what's the, mm. what's the early 2000s place of growth? And I thought, well, it's China. So I decided that I was going to go to China when I graduated from high school and I studied Chinese in school. Um, I never got fluent, unfortunately, got a little lazy, but I went out to Hong Kong as a study abroad student in 2006 mm. for a semester. And then I was like, I'm moving here. So I've just found a way to get a job. So it was Hong Kong, not China? Not China, yeah. Because you loved Hong Kong? Well, because I couldn't speak Chinese fluently. So the other program... True. Even Shanghai is very difficult if you don't speak, if you don't speak yeah, Chinese. Yeah, so my particular yeah. university, it was a full immersion program. And if I didn't, if you weren't fluent in Mandarin, you couldn't take the course. Mm. So uh, Hong Kong was the next best option. And then I loved Hong Kong. Hong Kong is amazing. I also yeah. lived there in 2013. It's amazing. Like, oof. Oof. Good memories. <laughs> <laughs> Some things not to be talked about yeah. on this podcast. <laughs> so you start to work uh, in Hong Kong for bank, right? Yes. I worked for Deutsche Bank yep. for three years and then Citibank. And then I eventually got let go from my job. And that's how I found crypto. How did you find crypto? I, I think read you were it. doing some arbitrage in the beginning, I right? I read about it on Zero Hedge first. And okay. then when I lost my job, I was like, well, I want to do something different. And then, well, I heard about this Bitcoin thing. What is it? So I just started reading everything I could about it. Read the white paper, uh, read whatever research there was out there at the time. And mm -hmm. then I was like, okay, well, how do you trade Bitcoin? So I read about every exchange that you could do spot trading, every exchange you could trade, futures contracts and options at the time. And I stumbled upon this small exchange called ICBit. And there was two Russian guys in the Caribbean, anonymous, and they had launched the first futures contracts on Bitcoin. And it was super really, it was super interesting because, you know, if you're familiar with futures trading, usually they traded a premium discount to the spot mm -hmm. price, right? And so I'm I did this trade all day long on like equities. In in, in bank, exactly. In banking. Yep. So like, well, okay, what's it like in in Bitcoin? So I downloaded the specs um and I looked at the price. And I was like, wow, like it's a 200% annum return. I did the calculation like, this is this can't be right. So let me just try it out. So I said, okay, well, I'll send, I sent $1,000 to MT Gox because mm -hmm. I thought it sounded less sketchy to send money to Japan than to Slovenia where Bitstamp was based. Yep. So I sent them $1,000, I bought some Bitcoin, I sold these futures contracts on this random exchange, and then I waited a month and I did the math on my Excel and my calculations of anticipated profit matched exactly what my uh, what the exchange said. Wow. Okay. Wow. It's amazing. And, and this is, this is your, you got laid off and then you have some time yeah. to figure out what to do. And you're like, oh, there's this Bitcoin thing and there is this future contract. I can, it's first, it's very interesting. And second, I can try to make money around yeah. that, right? Exactly. So you did that for? I did it for a few months. Then I okay. started doing arbitrage between China and the rest of the world. And then I decided what, that. What did this look like? Concretely doing arbitrage between China and the rest of the world. What did this look like? Basically, back in the day, there were you know three big exchanges: Huobi, BTC China, and um, OKCoin. And you know anyone could open an account, so open an account. Um, and I was able to buy Bitcoin at most of the exchanges. Were thankfully they were based in Hong Kong, even though they were international. Mm -hmm. So I literally could walk out of my apartment with a bag of cash, go to the bank, <laughs> deposit the bank in my bank account in Hong Kong, uh, wire it to these exchanges based in Hong Kong, like Bitfinex and some of the other ones that were based there, buy Bitcoin at the dollar international price, send it to you know Chinese exchanges, sell it for RMB. Then I go to the bus station, I get on the bus with my backpack, to withdraw my cash from the bank and then I go back across the border and then I make, you know, 20 to 40%. So this would not have, have a, this wouldn't have not have been possible in any other place. Hong basically. Kong is the only place on in the world. You so you were this. at the right spot yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, obviously you, Look, is where preparation meets opportunity and like you prepared for five years before that and then you are curious, but then you are at the right spot where you can actually do all this physical thing. Yeah, in this, this faster, uh, it's cheaper. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, amazing. And, and then how did the BitMEX ID come along? Is it from this experience? Well, or is it... the issue with uh, IC, but the exchange was me and a lot of the other traders, we really wanted them to 
improve the product offering, offer more stuff, increase liquidity because we were all making money. We just want to make more money. So we needed them to grow as an exchange. So we had more people to trade against. Yeah. And I just wasn't, didn't, wasn't feeling that they were really trying to grow their exchange such that I could make a living doing this. Mm. So like, well, fuck it. Like I know how to do this. I did this for my whole professional career. I can do it better. And so that's where the idea came from. And when is that? Futures contracts on Bitcoin. But no, when is that? 2013, 2014? Uh, end of 2013. Okay. And so, you know, through my network, I was able to find my other two co-founders who, um, one built trading systems, name is Ben Deal, and the other was Sam Reed, and he built like web applications. And so they were both into crypto. I was like, hey guys, why don't we build a der derivatives exchange on Bitcoin? And they're like, yeah, let's do it. So we came together in early 2014, and then we started building BitMEX. And I, just after a few months, Mount Gox happens. So you're super motivated. You're like, oh, it's amazing. We can build that. But then Mangox happens, the hack of Mangox. And it's the start of a bear market, right? So like you're starting to, you're starting a new business in the beginning of a bear market, which is pretty much the worst moment to do it. Well, I think it was good because I think we went into it thinking, okay, we're not going to raise any venture capital funding because mm -hmm. we're actually, we know that exchanges make money. Like it, they just, it's a business model that makes money. Now, maybe the UVCs didn't understand what derivatives were, but I've seen ICB and I knew how much money they made. Like, it wasn't big money, but it was like, okay, we can have a comfortable life. We like this Bitcoin thing. Yeah. We can make money doing it. We don't need outside financing as long as we can figure out ways to make money to pay the rent and whatever. Um, and I wrote side hustles. So it wasn't like all of a sudden we were banking on this check from some VC and now because of Mt. Gox, they weren't investing. Um, if anything, it basically gave us the ethos of like, you know, transparency, honesty, not your keys, not your coin, yeah. like all that sort of stuff that I think is very inbred for people who've been around for long enough um, to understand these concepts because they viscerally have experienced, you know, ma major setbacks. Yeah, absolutely. Companies. Yeah. I mean, I thought that this was only, you know, old stuff in crypto, but with what happened last year, like it was yeah. a great reminder that, hey, uh, either we're still early in crypto, either this stuff is still happening for quite a while. Yeah. So you're building, uh, you're bootstrapping basically BitMEX. Yes. Right. For quite a long time. Because people would always, people always think, you know, overnight success story, right? And the classic, it's a classic 10 years or classic seven years overnight success story. So how long are you in basically this stealth mode and what's going on in your mind there? Are you thinking at some point, man, this is not going to take off as much as I want. I should maybe do something else. Or you're thinking, it's cool. I'm making decent money and I do some, what I love. So I'm as patient as what's needed for the market to pick up again and for us to basically explode, you know? So, I mean, we took us 11 months to build the product. We launched in mm -hmm. November, 2014. And then for the next basically year, we basically did no volume, essentially mm -hmm. like zero, it's very little trades. And yeah, it was very disheartening, it's hard. But in the back of my mind, I was 100% confident that Bitcoin derivatives or crypto derivatives would be massive. There would be a few mm. companies making a lot of money. The only question is, can I survive long enough to get there? So I'm just going to keep going until I utterly fail because I know someone's going to make a fuck ton of money doing this. Mm. I hope it's me. <laughs> we kept going and we iterated at the product. And, you know, thankfully the market started recovering in 2015. We oriented our business towards China, which is where all the volume was mm. back then. And, you know, Perpetual swap came in 2016 and you know, we started making a little bit of money and just gaining momentum of just so being around. Is there, so is there a tipping point or it's more how uh, we do perp swap? Basically, we invented it, the, the contract 100x. Um, and this makes the whole difference. Like that's what people like to read and hear, but like it's probably not the truth, right? The truth is we try this, we try that. It's a bit better. It's a bit better. It's so a bit the first big it, change was in the fall of 2015, we said, okay, fuck it. We had a very conservative margin model because we were um, guaranteeing all the contract payouts mm. with our own meager de minimis cash flow. Uh, then we said, fuck it. Well, the Chinese, are, well, they want leverage and let's do it better than them. If they were doing 20X, we're gonna do 100X because we know how, we can build this tech better. We know where they're making mistakes in terms of how they're margining things. And that's what we did. So that's what we became known for overnight was the exchange that offered the highest leverage of anyone in crypto. And we did it without losing money as the exchange. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of other players offered high leverage but they lost money as the exchange because they didn't have the math right um, or their tech wasn't fast enough. And so that was so the, the difference was the math and the tech yeah. concretely. And this made a big difference in terms of volume, 
quickly? Uh, almost immediately. And we started, ah, okay. we started cash flow positive, making money, um, being able to like actually pay ourselves. I mean, it was paying out some, um, of, of money, but at least pay the rent and whatever. Mm. Uh, and allowed us to just keep going and keep iterating on this concept and just survive. And then there is the crazy bull market, 2016, 17. Yeah, so in 2016, we created the perpetual swap. That was basically, um, it was an abject failure. You know, I would say two thirds of me and my partner, so me and one other partner, um, were very f- pro the swap. Okay. Another partner hated it because we got so much negative comments from our clients. Um, they were like, what are you doing? What's this this swap thing? I don't understand funding. Why don't you just do it like OK Coin? Just go back to the futures contracts. Mm. And we were like, well, we did this for a reason. We did it because our clients didn't understand what a futures contract was. We wanted to create something that was a little bit more intuitive from a trading perspective. And then we wanted to consolidate the little liquidity that we had in one product versus spread out across a bunch of different expiries. So, you know, I won the political battle internally to keep it up. And we kept iterating on it. And finally, like starting in 2017, it started to catch on. And over like we woke up one day like, wow, we're, we're this thing is doing massive volumes. Like, where, where did this, how did this even happen? So 2017 happens, like we all know it was crazy. Yeah. And then 2018 happens, bear market. But for you, because people are able to short, it's actually great, a, amazing. It. It's, it's basically the only business in, yeah. in the crypto game where it's amazing whether it goes up or down, you don't really care. You're making money both ways, yeah. right? What was the golden moment of BitMEX, the bear market, or more like the bull market 2017? If you had to um, say like 18, 19, I think. 18, 19. So actually, when everybody's struggling, you're there like. Yeah, <laughs> luckily we had a product. That it took if the competition about one and a half years to accept that they should build it. Um, so we had the market to ourselves. You're able to charge, you know, relatively high yeah. fees if you take, think about where fees are today um, in derivatives. Um, so it was a you know, great time. Yeah, so controlling most of the derivative market, basically. What was a typical week like for you in that moment? Because obviously you're so successful, like you still go to work every day, like super focused, like build the next thing, or you're just like, oh man, I can relax a bit more. It's the bear market, people are struggling, but we're doing great. Or like, what's your focus at that moment? Uh, I mean, it became a lot of HR stuff, right? So we yeah. hired a lot of people. We went from 10 to, I don't know, 100 something in two years. Yeah. So there was a lot of problems, um, growing pains, trying to do that. Our tech didn't work at scale. Mm-hmm. So um, there was just putting out fires, trying to, you know, the classic handle, handle this, story, actually. Handle People this think volume. everything works well, but yeah. like you have basically fire there, yeah. fire there, fire there. I need to, what's the most important one to take care of? Yeah. Okay. And then 2020 happens, COVID. Uh, I, I was actually, a tr- uh, I had 80% of my net worth on BitMEX on the ETH contract right. at 2x leverage, right? I was, I, was, I was thinking I was smart. I was like, oh man, yeah. I can play higher numbers. Yeah but 2x leverage. I didn't really understand the funding fees that were higher on right. ETH contract. And I didn't think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the World Health Organization would declare COVID as pandemic and then like stock market 34% yeah. down and crypto within one day, 15. 12, 13 or whatever, 14th of March, down 50, 60, 70%, whatever, like wrecked. Yeah. <laughs> Spent three days in my bed. <laughs> <laughs> but I was actually with the other 20% of my money. Yeah. That was in gold and stocks right. down. I sold everything to buy ETH because like ETH is sub 100. Like this is, so I was in my bed like yeah. Yeah. with pain in my belly, but buying that. Anyway, if I was a fly on the wall on the 12th or 13th of March in the Bitcoin, uh, BitMEX HQ, like what was happening? Because it's fucking madness. Like I even remember that exact moment in Switzerland, in Geneva, that moment I get liquidated, like I'm sweating everywhere. Like well, how did you guys right, handle I mean- that? Well, we unfortunately we got DDoS that day, so exchange went down for I don't know fifteen minutes or however long it was. Prices collapsing, right? Uh, yeah, we think it goes to zero. It goes to zero. Yeah. The exchange goes offline. Now, I know popular Twitter things that we shut off the exchange to save Bitcoin. Mm. No, we got DDoS and got fucked. Right? We would love to keep the exchange up. Our, mm. our goal isn't to try to time the markets or anything. And then that happens. We get the exchange back up uh, after you know an hour or so. And then the market fucking rallies, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Classic. Just Classic. like the, the death of the liquidation candle. And Once then, everybody's dead, it goes back up. Yeah. yeah. 
But it wasn't it was, obviously it wasn't a very good moment for the exchange because a lot of people lost a lot of money because yeah. they didn't understand how these exotic derivatives actually work on the downside. Mm. And, and as a result, a lot of people left BitMEX and went to other platforms that didn't use Bitcoin as a collateral mechanism. And it's you know probably not interesting for this crowd and the nonlinearity of these things when they go down. But this is yeah. why people didn't understand it and they they got wrecked. Um, and so they said, well, we want to we want to use a different type I'm of, one of them. <laughs> margin and currency that yep. we didn't offer at the time. And so we lost a lot of business because of that incident. Mm. What was happening in your mind in that uh, that day, basically, when the the exchange, exchange doesn't work anymore? Like what's going on through your mind? Well, like I mean, what is the first thing you even do? You can't do anything, but you think, what, no, is, you what are you call, thinking? You, okay, what's going on? Do we understand what the problem is? Yes. Okay. Then, then you fix it, right? Then you, after so that, fairly cool. you analyze the damage, you know, is the exchange okay? Do we lose any money as the exchange? No. Okay. Obviously there are lots of customers mm. um, that have complaints. And so then we, every, we have meetings, right? With all the senior managers, like, okay, there's these customers who lost money because of this. There's that, these customers lost because of, money because of that. Can we do anything? Does it make any sense? Are we encouraging moral hazard on the exchange if we try to change policies to favor one group over the other? So it's a lot of philosophical discussions and then people arguing for their particular client base of why they should get some sort of special treatment or not. Um, in the end, we didn't really do anything. We said, these are the rules. And unfortunately, some people lost. Mm. Um, they didn't like that, obviously, but that's just part of the game. Where do you think BitMEX would be today if there was no COVID? No COVID crash, no COVID. Have you ever thought about that? No, like, never thought never, about it. Like, oh man, like this was really bad because you said a lot of customers left. Never thought about that. No. You love to talk about macro and I, mean, I love your macro PCs. It's super cool, super interesting. What's your view right now? Basically, I mean, I know the view, but like for the audience, what's your view? The view is basically whatever the Fed does, Bitcoin is going to yeah, so buy I the dip. The, but like, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so I think that we're at this point in history where we've had this idea that the government can fix everything, right? So that's Keynes, right? If you have a problem, government spends money and plugs the hole and then we're all better for it, right? And so we've all taken this theory and this is everybody, not just, you know, the United States and, you know, England, Western Europe, China, Japan, mm. everybody, right? We're going to have this Keynesian economic theory, and that's going to inform how we um, try to eliminate the business cycle, right? So we've basically amassed all of this debt starting after World War II, and essentially, you know, Europe was destroyed, Asia was destroyed, and there's just the U.S. left in terms of like a productive economic unit. And we drilled a bunch of hydrocarbons, and then we spent all this all this wealth on whatever, right? Some countries bombed the fuck out of the world. Other countries had free health care, yep. like whatever. Yep. Depending on your political situation, you spent the money somehow. And then we stopped having kids, and technology of, like, hydrocarbons sort of plateaued in terms of, like, getting that initial boost in productivity. And so now we still have all this debt to pay back. And we're accustomed to growing at a very fast pace because, you know, humanity essentially has just like skyrocketed in terms of complexity as, as a civilization over the past hundred years. And so we just pile on debt because there's not more humans that need more stuff, but we've got all this debt we have to pay back and we don't have enough people that need to do things to pay it back. And so we just keep piling on debt and keep piling on debt. And every time there's a crisis, the economic theory says, that, well, the government should run a deficit and then the central bank should print money and then, you know, save the banking system. So we kept doing it over and over and over again. And now we're to the point where every single part of the fiat financial system, the government authorities have destroyed the free market and everything. Everything's a manipulated market. Mm -hmm. And the only market left that actually is almost free-ish are government bond markets because they're so big and so hard to control. And so now we're seeing, well, we have, you know, declining productivity in terms of how we extract resources. We have political choices that say we don't want to use hydrocarbons anymore. So cost of energy is going up. We are less integrated as a world and certain countries are saying, well, hold on. Yeah, it was great for the US and Western Europe the past 80 years, but it wasn't so great for me. And so I want, you know, instead of taking my natural resources and giving me back, like, fuck all, I want you to develop, you know, value added products in my country and export them. And that increases the price of stuff. So we have this inflation, and inflation is one thing that governments can't will out of existence. And so what's the response? I think we are going to blow the biggest fiat 
money printing bubble ever over the next few years to try to save the biggest market in the world, which is the sovereign bond market of governments. When you talk about inflation, do you talk about inflation, inflation as we experienced in the last year and a half, or do you talk about asset price inflation or both? I think the the asset What? price inflation has been happening forever. The inflation that really pisses off the common person is when food food goes up. We can feel it here. Huh? Food, rent, everything. Right. everything. People are starting to go really get really mad. The taxi drivers, right. everyone is really mad about it. And so and that's and when that happens. And that the government has to do something. And so they're like, well, we need to tighten monetary supply. But at the other end, the, the governments have made all these promises to people like healthcare and education and defense budgets and blah, 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 whatever. And so and they don't want to raise taxes because no one actually wants to pay for this stuff out of their own pocket. They want someone else to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And so, well, what do you do? You On one hand, you have to fight inflation by restraining credit growth and reducing economic activity. But then that means that the government can't fund itself on all this massive debt to make good on the promises that they made. And so we're at this sort of inflection point and see which one they choose. So if you were the Singaporean government, because we both live in Singapore and you have the taxi drivers and all the people, all the normal people who are suffering because of the high rents and the high food and the inflation, what would you do? Well, Singapore is in a lucky position. They have one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. So it's, it's just a political choice of like, how much do they want to dip into their pockets and pay for stuff, right? Mm -hmm. There's been consumption vouchers, you know, they kind of massage the bus fares and all that sort of stuff. So if there's enough public outcry, the Singaporean government is lucky enough that it's a small country, export-led, they can afford to mask the, the effects. I think I hear that Singapore government has enough money so that if Singapore was erased, erased like nine times, yeah. they could rebuild everything again, right? Now, if you're the U.S. government, what would you do? People complaining about inflation, but you have your promise. I mean, you have these promises on one side of like healthcare, all that stuff, but it's also the promise, the, the hidden promise of like making market go up forever, right? Well, I think you're going to have to think about, well, I'm a politician and I want to get reelected, right? From their perspective, it's, well... I could go out there and tell the people, you know what, I'm really sorry, but people that are now dead made the decision that they wanted to give a bunch of free stuff away and they mortgaged your future and now the bills come due and you're going to have to pay it. And that means that there's not going to be Medicare and Medicaid for you and the quality of things is going to go down. But if you persevere, maybe your children will have a better future, right? That could be one politician. Mm -hmm. They won't be wrong for very long. Or the other one says... Hey, I've heard of this thing. I got I've heard of this thing called the printing press, and we're we're just going to do this inflation thing. I'm not going to tell you about it. We're going to run run the inflation really really hot, and everyone's going to have a job. Uh, we'll just get wage increases, and we'll punish the evil corporations that are price gouging and blah blah blah. Right. So, again, if I'm a politician and I want to get reelected, I don't tell the sober truth, which is unfortunately we just can't afford to do make good on these promises anymore. I'd say I, I have this thing called the printing press and I'm going to use it, right? What's the end game? Uh, the end game is some sort of societal reset, I think. Um, hopefully not as bad as the Great Depression or, you know, World War I or World War II, but I think we're headed in a similar sort of direction where you're going to have to choose one or the other. And this sovereign debt market is just so big and so large and almost probably uncontrollable that um, some countries are just not going to to make it. A friend, a friend of mine, he's a hedge fund manager. I had a coffee with him a few weeks ago, and he had a really poignant statement. I'm going to write an essay about it maybe in a few months' time when I have some time. He said, uh, global crisis, Japan starts to li lights the match, the fire burns brightest in China, and Europe gets destroyed. And um, and that's sort of where, we're at, where we are today. There is there's a match being lit in terms of how Japan – which is at the furthest end of this ridiculousness in terms of money printing and um, a government bond dysfunction, they have to make a choice. Um, that choice is going to influence what China does because, you know, they're big competing export powers. And then America should be fine because America can feed itself and has enough energy and they have population growth and uh, secure borders. Europe, I think Euro's fucked. Um, and when some countries want to leave the Euro and other countries say we need to be stick tight as Europeans, there might be war. In that kind of event, like massive deleveraging event, where everybody becomes poor, basically, even if you own assets, right? Where do you store your? Uh, where where do you become the least poor? 
Where do you I have my money? It's more like, you know, forget all the material stuff. It's like, do I have a house? Mm. What's my food supply? Right. Okay. And that's it. Um, and I'm at in a place that is able to provide those two things. Mm. Otherwise, yes, then you have to start becoming a big speculator. Okay, is this particular currency that I hold going to be useful enough in the near future for me to feed myself? Yeah, so buy a house and uh, become a farmer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, talk about, uh, you talked about the stealth, I mean, Balaji and you, yeah. stealth financial crisis. Where are we at with that? Because it's, I mean, stealth financial crisis for a reason, because they don't talk about it too much. But there was quite a lot of talk on Twitter a couple of months back, and now gone. It seems, seems gone. Yeah, Hopefully so it's not the, gone. the banks in 20 and 21, at least in the U.S., they took in a lot of deposits. And this is around the world, right? COVID stimulus, everybody's got a lot of money. Government's busy handling, handing it out, left, right, and center. So what do you do? You stick your money in the bank, right? And what do the regulators want you to do? They want the banks to buy the government debt because no one else will do it because it's a bad trade. If the economy is growing at 2% or 3% and they offer you 1%, why would I buy that debt? I should, why give me 3%? Don't make money off of me, government, right? So no one in their right mind wants to own government bonds. So financial regulation is all about taking captive pools of capital, whether that's your pension fund, insurance products, um, bank deposits, and through accounting rules, making it uh, very profitable for them to just buy the government debt. So if you buy a treasury bond as a bank, you can lever it in an infinite amount And it doesn't count against your capital requirements. So what do the banks do? They bought as much government debt at the lowest interest rates in human history because they had all these deposits because they were encouraged to by the rules and their financial regulators. And then unfortunately, what happened was inflation. And when inflation shows up, the central banks have to try to do something. And they raise interest rates, which bond yields go up, bond prices go down. Mm -hmm. The entire world banking system is insolvent, essentially. And so now- need the banking system? It's the banking system. They're all insolvent. Every single one of them. But is it only the banks or is it other uh, insurances or... I hear, yeah, like, they're, Maladie they're, talks about pension funds and other things out there. Like the much entire bigger. fiat financial system, if you actually used proper um, accounting and valuation of what they own, they're all insolvent. Yeah. So now the question is, who pays the bill? It's a political question. And every single country has a different political structure and they determine... Who pays the cost of the bailout of the financial services sector? Um, and mm-hmm. so that's what's going on right now. It's we're trying to determine, okay, well, who, who, which organization is going to take the fall for this? Who's, whose head's getting chopped? Who's getting blamed? Who's going to be out of office? That's the fight that's going on behind the scenes right now because there is, it's, it's insolvent. Unless we somehow discover some new form of energy that mm-hmm. makes us all super duper productive immediately, then, you know, it's really just managing this insolvency. And so, so to help this situation, We could lower interest rates, which would be good for Bitcoin, yes. for asset prices, basically for uh, risk asset prices. Or they can continue, say, oh, we fight against inflation, we increase uh, interest rates. But then you have these insolvent companies and banks that basically go bankrupt and yep. need to be bailed out with money printing, which is good for Bitcoin too. That's the, right. basically the basically. thesis. So basically both in both situations, a bit like... A bit like after in 2020, after COVID, I mean, the beginning of COVID, it was, it was okay. Everything is aligned if you're patient enough. Exactly. Especially given the halving and everything is aligned for crypto to go. Yeah, up. we can't predict the timing and no one, can, no one can tell you that, but it's all about constructing a portfolio that has, you know, asymmetric returns on the upside and doesn't cost you a lot in terms of to hold it, right? That's the point. So like, I mean, like your bit, BitMEX story in 2016, 15, 16 is, can I stay in the game long enough to reap the rewards of the next bull market? And now it's, people should think like that. Can I be invested long enough and have a normal job or whatever that pays the bill to reap uh, the benefits of the next bull market, which exactly. hopefully comes next year, in the next two years as hopefully. this cycle. Hopefully. <laughs> we'll see bull market is so much fun. I want yeah. more bull markets. <laughs> <Real warm movie. laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for this. This is awesome. And see you at the pool party exactly. tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. This is awesome. That was very cool. So, nice. Uh,